Welcome, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft. Uh, today you announced a $19 billion investment into Canada's AI landscape. Now there are very many facets to this investment, but particularly in people and yeah. skills development. Do you mind sharing how learners, educators, and teachers are going to benefit directly from this investment? Well, I think that's the key question. How can people put this to work in their own work or their own lives? And you know, this investment, it's huge. We're building huge AI data centers. That's all about making the technology available to people. And then for people, it's, okay, well, what can I use this for? What should I use it for? And I just think, you know, whether you're a doctor or a nurse, a teacher, a researcher, um, we can talk a little bit about it, but I guarantee there is something in this for you. There is something here that you can use in the next 12 months that are that will help you do your job better and be more productive and frankly address probably the part of the job you like the least you know, and, and, and let you automate that piece with the help of AI. Mm -hmm. And at, from experience, you know, I was a nonprofit leader, yeah. I worked in communications, but now I hope to complete my education to be a double doctor. But I see every single day medical learners feel overwhelmed with not having the skills to integrate AI into their practice and into the medical system. So is there any part of this investment that you are prioritizing for young learners and specifically those in healthcare? Um, absolutely. There's a part of this investment that is about skilling programs, both with and through nonprofits and say employers like hospitals is just one example. Um, you know, but also educational institutions and also online. And I think you know, it, it's great to think about a couple of examples. Uh, you think about a, a nurse practitioner or any kind of medical practitioner, including a doctor. They talk with patients. They need to capture a record of what they learned. I was seeing a doctor in the Seattle area where I live, and it was very interesting. This was a few months ago, and she said to me, now, I have this AI tool that I would like to use, but I need your consent. It will listen to our conversation and it will do the first draft of notes for me. It's called Microsoft Copilot. Is it okay if I use it? And I said, let's give that a shot. Uh, you know, and you know, the same thing, you know, a teacher recently that I met said, at the beginning of every school year, it typically took him three weeks to revise and prepare the lesson plans for the year said so now it's down to four days. And with these new tools, and frankly, they're like all tools, you, know, you just have to start using them, you need to learn a bit, but then you start learning by using, you, know, it, you can demystify it quickly. Yeah. And as someone who's worked in education, like I, we, I run a program right now in an elementary school to help students become change makers. And we were discussing with the faculty how much time they feel like they're wasting every mm -hmm. single day, just trying to honestly compete with the younger staff members who are coming in with the AI literacy. Yeah. And so I know that AI readiness also, we've seen the differences in rural areas versus urban areas for young learners, but also for young soon to be educators. Uh, how has this, how is this investment going to bridge that gap between the urban and the rural disparities? Well. Ultimately, it's about working with organizations that work with the people yeah. who need the technology. Mm -hmm. So if it's people in a rural community, um, it's organizations that f focus on support for rural communities. Um, they are often great nonprofits. We give them the technology tools. We give them training materials. We learn from them to make the training materials better. We provide funding. But it's also where I think it, it makes clear government has a role to play as well, to fund the organizations to give them the capacity they need to reach across these communities. I think that will be one of the key needs here across Canada and in other countries over the next five years. And along the lines in bridging the gap, uh, one key area of this investment that I found phenomenal was the, you know, historically there have been groups that have been left to the sidelines and not prioritized. And I learned today that there's a focus on AI learning for indigenous youth, blending tech and their cultural heritage, uh, their world view. And what was the motivation behind this inclusivity in, in the plan? I think we learned over the past decade that digital technology and then AI play critical roles in culture, in promoting and protecting, preserving 
especially the culture of an indigenous people. Because you think about the attributes that have to come together to do that. Often it's a local language that isn't spoken by as many people. We've created AI tools that help preserve the language and engage in translation, that's key. Yeah, this ability to capture the history of a place, to show what it looked like before, um, to preserve digitally what we call a digital twin mm -hmm. of places or say artifacts, because the, you know, the artifacts, the physical things, the works of art or artisanship that these communities play is so critical. AI can capture this, it can digitize it, it can share it, it can make it available. Uh, I think that the youth in indigenous communities have this extraordinary opportunity to, you know, frankly, master these AI skills, maybe more or before their elders do, but then they can show how they can do what other people before them could not do to capture, to keep, to promote this kind of cultural heritage. And we're so lucky to have that opportunity with AI to actually preserve culture, share culture in a new way, and in a way that's um, easily digestible for all folks across Canada uh, so that we start to blend and see the different worldviews actually coming into practice. Like one thing that I prioritize in medicine is uh, centering the patient and their worldview, their values, and having tools like AI to be able to capture those different identities such as like indigenous communities and their values will make me a better doctor, will make me a more proficient educator. AI, I think, not only helps people do new things in a new way, it can shrink the distance mm -hmm. between them. So if you take take an indigenous community or take St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, where we've created a digital twin with the Vatican, all of a sudden you enable somebody in a different part of a country or half the world away to experience that. And, and it makes it not just more real, but more meaningful for them. Or let me share another example, a startup that we're working with in the United States. It's called One Room. Basically, it's all about healthcare. It creates a room in a rural community, often with an indigenous community. It has a wall that is a floor to ceiling video screen, it has a, a medical technician, an assistant, including with AI tools. The patient sits in a really comfortable chair. The doctor can be literally a thousand miles away, but is as real as life, can you know, talk with the patient, if the patient, say, has a parent or, or a child somewhere that you want to bring into the conversation, they can be part of that screen as well. By shrinking distance, I think you improve the healthcare experience and the healthcare capabilities that are available to people. So, just like electricity changed every part of the human experience, I think AI will change the human experience as well. And I think there's a lot of fear sometimes online that AI is making us more lonely, it's contributing to our loneliness epidemic, but I would actually argue it's promoting human connection based on the example that you've just shared. And by promoting human connection, that's what we're all here for. That is true. And at the same time, I would say, it's good that we listen to people's fears mm -hmm. because the best way to avoid those fears becoming real is to put in place the guardrails that protect the use of the technology and, and, and prevent its abuse or misuse that actually guides tech companies like Microsoft to build these products in a responsible way. So let's listen to the fears and make good use of those concerns and address them. And you take a person-centered approach in everything that you do and even the way that you are uh, sharing your thoughts and excitement for today. My last question for you is if you were to leave young learners with one piece of advice, what would it be? Use this technology because by using it, you will learn how to get good at using it. So use Microsoft Copilot. You download it on your phone for free and use it or use ChatGPT or some other similar product. But what I would say is Use it to ask more questions. You'll ask it to do one thing and you'll get an answer, but start to use it so you can learn more. And by doing that, you're gonna make yourself smarter, not just about the topic you're inquiring about, but ultimately what I've learned most in life, the most successful people are not those who have the most answers. It's the people who ask the most questions. AI is an extraordinary tool. Because you get questions answered faster, you can ask more questions. Thank you. 
I'm going to ask more questions. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate your time today, and good luck with the rest of, I know you have a busy press lineup yeah. over the next few days.